Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there. And so uh, today I will uh, talk about gravitational waves from inflation. And of, I'll try to give an overview of some of the um, um, some of the aspects of, of this topic. Of course, uh, it's not going to be exhaustive. It's going to be from my point of view uh, um, and myself and uh, my collaborators. And this, uh, this talk is based on a number of papers in collaboration with these uh, uh, wonderful people that I'm listening here. Um, so let me, um, let me give you a brief overview. I will start by saying just a few things about inflation and the question, and then I will be moving on to um, discussing what kind of uh, gravitational wave background do we expect from inflation uh, and what information can we extract from the gravitational wave background if we were to observe it, either CMB or um, at smaller uh, scales. And then um, the, this talk will be about also how to uh, characterize it. So what are the important observables that we uh, rely on in order to this to um, characterize the background and um, so, for instance, identify um, the mechanism generating the gravitational waves as well as uh, so, for example, distinguish uh, a, cosmolo a possible cosmological source from an astrophysical source or distinguish the, the various cosmological sources from each other or uh, distinguish, um, identify signatures that are specific to uh, given models, uh, in, the, in our case, inflationary models. So this is the, let's say, the approach and the, um, the yeah, the, the idea behind the whole uh, presentation. Okay, so I uh, will be focusing on gravitational waves from inflation. Um, I, I'm sure this audience doesn't need much introduction. I'm just gonna say a few words. Um, so with inflation, we uh, identify the um, very early epoch in the history of the universe characterized by um, an accelerated nearly exponential expansion. And uh, we need inflation to explain the observations, for example, if inflation explains, um, gives a, a, a justification on how, why the universe, why the cosmic microwave background is so nearly perfectly uniform across very large distances. And in the simplest picture of inflation, we use a single scalar field in slow roll. So um, throughout the stock, when I refer to single field slow roll as FSR, um, I will be, <clears throat> I will be uh, referring to this class of models where you have inflation driven by a single uh, scalar field and characterized by a nearly flat potential for a sufficient number of defaults. So uh, everything that goes beyond that would be, uh, you know, beyond single fit slow roll. And uh, okay, in the simplest inflationary uh, model, the quantum uh, fluctuations of the scalar field uh, are what we think the seeds for um, structure in the universe for the perturbations in the cosmic microwave background. And uh, these are stretched by the expansion and they, um, they generate uh, uh, these, these fluctuations that we observe. And most interesting for this talk, I will be focusing on the prediction, uh, which is common to all inflationary models of a stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, so this slide is mostly for um, the sake of notation because um, I will be referring to the um, gravitational waves, um, which are the tensorial, period tensorial perturbations of the metric as gamma. So um, with gamma, I indicate the two polarization states of the graviton. And um, in, um, yeah, sorry, let me, let me now uh, focus uh, for a moment for the uh, on the evolution equation for gamma. So uh, whenever I show this equation, I will mean it during inflation. So I'm focusing on the tons of perturbations during inflation and what happens to them. And I'm, I'm writing here the evolution equation. So on the left-hand side, of course, we have something like a wave equation with the addition of a term which accounts for the uh, expansion of the universe or the evolution of the universe. 
um, with, uh, with the Hubble here. And on the right hand side goes everything that can contribute to the anisotropic stress energy tensor. Now, during inflation, um, uh, okay, in general, the, this equation will have the general solution will be the sum of the solution to the homogeneous equation, so setting the right hand side to zero, plus the solution to the inhomogeneous equation. Now, it uh, turns out that if we set uh, the right hand side to zero during inflation, we have what we call the gravitational waves from vacuum fluctuation. So we have production of vacuum out, out of the um, uh, we have production of gravitons out of the vacuum in an expanding universe. And um, on the other hand, if I account for um, whatever fields are there during inflation, including the inflaton, um, under certain uh, conditions, for example, if we have a scalar field, if the scalar field has um, is varying in space, then these are going to contribute to the right hand side of this equation, and this will uh, will uh, contribute. This will give us. Um, what I'm going to refer to as uh, gravitational wave from sources. Now, these gravitational wave from sources, they are an additional contribution to the vacuum, to the gravitational waves from the vacuum. And uh, in general, we do not worry about those uh, because they, um, in, in the simplest inflationary models, if, if we uh, restrict ourselves to those models where you have just one scalar field uh, in slow roll, those are not very interesting. The reason being that they are subleading with respect to the uh, homogeneous solution. So, for example, if you have just one scalar field, uh, your inflaton, uh, this term on the right hand side will be proportional, to, it will be uh, at least quadratic in the inflaton uh, perturbations, and those uh, are, have to be small. Um, and um, so in general, we do not worry about those, but uh, as soon as you have some extra field content, which can be, you know, we can justify in a number of ways. Um, and actually from a certain perspective, it's actually more natural to have possibly additional fields besides the inflaton. Then at that point, uh, depending on your field content, depending on the interactions that you have, these um, additional gravitational wave from sources can become interesting. So during this talk, I will be giving some examples, uh, some classes of models which are very, let's say, have been very well uh, studied for a number, they have received a lot of attention for a number of reasons. Um, okay, so just um, if we just keep, I keep going with this uh, general picture. Okay, different different wavelength of the modes of the tensor perturbations. Uh, so different frequencies are going to probe different times, let's say during inflation. Uh, so the uh, in this plot I'm representing with um, with the red lines uh, the wavelength, the quantity related to the wavelength, and then the Hubble um, quantity related to the Hubble is in red, which is nearly constant during inflation, and then starts uh, increasing again. And basically, these uh, perturbations are um, amplified, and the wavelength is stretched, becomes super horizon during inflation, freezes uh, the, the modes freeze at the value that had a horizon crossing. Later on, when they re-entered, of course, they carry with them the information information on whatever went on during inflation. And wavelengths that are larger, um, uh, corresponding to smaller frequencies, they exit earlier and they re-enter later on. And um, so those are probably in earlier times during inflation and the, the smaller wavelengths, the larger frequencies, they are say probing later times during inflation. So what I ideally want to do is to have a, a observational window that encompasses many, many uh, decades in wavelength in order to have a full picture of inflation because the cosmic microwave background uh, on large scales is restricted only to uh, less than 10 e folds. And uh, we're lucky, of course, because we have all these uh, wonderful experiments uh, with which to access um, the uh, gravitational wave background from inflation. And uh, inflation predicts uh, the existence of the background throughout these frequencies from the very, very small ones, which will now be able to observe um, uh, because they, um, yeah, they correspond to the time between peak wave peaks of the order of the age of the universe. So this will be accessed with the cosmic microwave background on isotropies. 
uh, via the uh, B modes primarily, and then to the very, very large ones um, accessible with terrestrial interferometers. So um, now let's go to the what this gravitational wave background tells us about inflation. So I, I would identify four, uh, let's say, pieces of information that we can in general extract. So the, from the amplitude, we're going to uh, be able to say something about the energy scale of inflation, although only in the single field slow roll, um, well, in the simplest picture, let's say in general, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the tensor to scalar ratio, so the amplitude of these gravitational waves um, it, defined uh, CMB scales in this case and uh, the Hubble. Now this relation is one-to-one, -one, but we will see that um, it's not valid. Um, it's gonna be degenerate with other parameters as soon as your model uh, steers away from the simplest picture. And then again, in the simplest picture, you uh, expect uh, what we call the red tilt. So the amplitude of the gravitational waves is going to decrease when you go from the largest to the smallest scales. Um, and then we expect the two polarization states of the gravitons to behave exactly the same. Again, in the simplest picture, we call it a non chiral spectrum. And this also has imprints in the uh, higher endpoint functions. And then we expect it to be nearly Gaussian. So all these properties um, um, I will be discussing one by one, and I will give examples where they are, uh, they do not, they are violated as soon as we, um, as I mentioned, we go away from the simplest uh, manual scenario. So um, I'm gonna give you this picture uh, just to um, have a visualization of what it means to have a red tilt. In this picture, I am plotting uh, the, the energy density Perogative uh, unit of the frequency or the wave number as function of k, the wave number of the frequency up here, and uh, we show the uh, sensitivity limits of a number of uh, interferometers in space or on Earth, along with um, sensitivity limits of something like SKA, um, under certain assumptions, and in uh, uh, these lines correspond to uh, this is um, the constraint uh, currently placed uh, by cosmic microwave background on isotropies. Um, and, and this is what an experiment like LIBER could be able to uh, put as a constraint. So in this black line represents the, um, the energy density associated with the vacuum perturbation, the vacuum fluctuation. So stochastic gravitational wave background from the vacuum fluctuations. If the tensor to scalar ratio um, so the amplitude is, you know, is close to the current bound placed by the cosmic by microwave background. So something like a signal like this um, would not be as, um, particularly interesting for interferometers, except for maybe very futuristic, the next second generation interferometers such as Pepeng Observer. But let's say something like LISA or Einstein Telescope uh, or Taiji, would not, or of course, um, um, LIGO would not be able to observe it. And one of the questions that I'm asking is, of course, can inflation predict something beyond this signal? So something that is growing on small scales. Of course, this is a cartoonish picture just to, uh, just to give an idea. Uh, or can you predict some uh, features in the uh, energy density? Um, that may be uh, occurring at scales that are overlapping with um, the, pro the, the range of frequencies that we can actually probe. And then um, there is also chirality, which is a very important observable. And I will, um, so in the, in the next few slides, I will be discussing, uh, just to give an idea of um, uh, what can go on during inflation as soon as you relax the, the assumption of a single scalar field and slow roll. And, um, and I will give an idea also on what it means to um, uh, basically violate this prediction. So uh, chirality is particularly interesting because uh, of course the, the, the frequency profile, uh, I, should, I, just, I should stress it more, the frequency profile is going to be extremely important in order to identify uh, the, the, you know, the origin of uh, the stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, we expect to, to observe a stochastic gravitational wave background also from astrophysical sources besides inflation. 
and also um, so uh, and also I have to say there are additional cosmological hypothetical cosmological sources um, which can produce a stochastic radiation wave background cosmic strings. I'm sure you've heard about this uh, also in, this has been also mentioned in uh, previous talks. Um, yeah, first transition, cosmic strings, and so on. Also, reheating can generate it, although at larger frequencies. And of course, uh, being able to reconstruct the frequency profile will be extremely important as an, an extremely important, let's say, piece of information that we can uh, use to identify the origin. Uh, chirality also is extremely important. Uh, so chirality is not expected for uh, the astrophysical background. And, so if we were to observe some uh, chirality, we would certainly uh, be, that would point to a cosmological origin. And in terms of inflation, um, that would point, um, well, they could point to uh, some, some kind of dynamics that, um, okay, this is one possibility, of course, but it could point to uh, action engaged fields and I will be uh, presenting this, describing this class of models because historically they have been very important. They were initially introduced to make sense of a natural light in Pluton. And they were, um, you know, they are interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, they support reheating, they can generate a mechanism, they provide a mechanism for biogenesis. They are interesting uh, for primordial black hole formation. Um, they're interesting also in general because they involve fields that we are familiar with, I mean, the gauge fields um, or uh, the notion axons are also ubiquitous in particle physics. And so these are, a natural question is, can we, can we have axon engaged fields and what would those do if they were around uh, during inflation? And for the purpose of this talk, I will be discussing production of gravitational waves during, um, within these models. And uh, so le the main ingredients of these models are a, a nearly, I'm sorry, um, are an axon like field um, and then um, gauge fields. So this could be any type of gauge fields, a billion on a billion. And if, um, if you have these fields, then this coupling um, with F of tilde is there. And this coupling is, uh, is particularly important for the production of gravitational waves. And I will explain this um, by taking one such model. Um, there are many, many uh, realizations uh, with these ingredients, action and gauge field. And this is one possible realization that myself with uh, Matteo Fasiello and Tomori Fujita put forward uh, um, a few years ago. And it was inspired by the model by Achman, Achad and Wyman. And in this model, we have a spectator sector, which is made up by an axon and uh, so coupled to an S2 gauge field. And then we have an inflaton sector, which is taking care of inflating. So the mechanism that is uh, um, at the core of the sourcing of the gravitational waves, which is common to this class, this whole class of models, but that has then specific features um, in this model because of the choice of the non-abelian gauge field is that you have an axion that is rolling and is coupled to the gauge field. So as it rolls, um, the kinetic energy of the axion is basically um, being dumped into the gauge field sector, which are sustained. So they are produced and um, which would otherwise um, uh, quickly decay. So the gauge field perturbations in this specific S2 model, they are, uh, because, because of their non-abelian, because of the S2 is, is non-abelian, you, uh, you have a purely tensor component in these gauge fields, which are then able to source um, directly, meaning linearly, the metric perturbations. So you have a, a linear production of gravitational waves, and the interesting thing is that this linear production is not occurring at the level of the scalar sector. So um, these gauge fields are going to still influence the inflaton. So they will be contributing in to some level to the power spectrum or to the non-Gaussianity, but not in the same way. And this actually, this let's say separation, um, and this is because this is a tensor, of course, it cannot source linearly scalar. 
And this separation, I'd say, of sourcing mechanisms is crucial for um, this model to be able to generate an interesting gravitational wave uh, signal without, let's say, uh, violating the, the constraints that we have on the scalar graduations, which on CMB are very stringent. So um, we can have, so basically, if we go back to the previous slide that I showed, uh, where you have uh, gravitational wave from sources, these tensor perturbations from the gauge field would precisely contribute to linear order to the right hand side of this equation. And in these models, uh, the other interesting, there are a number of interesting features. So you, are, you have parity violation, and this parity violation is going to basically uh, source, you know, as a result, of, as I mentioned, one of the helicities of the tensor valuations will be more amplified than the other. And I will mention in a second what are the observational um, consequences of this. And the other part and the other property uh, uh, that we have is that in general we expect some kind of bump or feature uh, which may depending on your parameter space uh, may occur uh, on, on large scales or small scales but you see that in general we this is what we expect some some shape like this not a red spectrum um, and um, so this is this is a parameterization of what this uh, the power spectrum will look like for gravitational waves in this model, in these models, and um, and and uh, groups like um, Ichiro Komatsu's group uh, MPI they did some uh, a very nice uh, uh, you know forecast to see whether this bump will be observable by LISA or Swim Telescope or SKA. And in this case, uh, okay, depending on, of course, on the choice of parameters, uh, this may be possible uh, for LISA. Um, and uh, so what about chirality? So in, let's say in these models, we've already violated the first three predictions. So this is like also a, like a message that we should not take these predictions for granted at all, and we should investigate them, uh, make sure they, they are there. Otherwise we will have to look into uh, beyond the, the vanilla scenario. Now, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of chirality, there we have a number of ways to constrain it, and it's uh, I I think it's it's fascinating. Um, so for CMB, we've known for a long time how to constrain it. We are going to look for um, non-zero TB and EB cross correlations. These are sensitive to parity violation and hence to chirality. And um, in our models, um, you, for our specific model, you can also find the forecasts in this paper to see, for example, how well an experiment, like in, a, uh, in this case, a satellite like LIBER will be able to constrain the chirality on these models under what uh, kind of assumptions. And then at interferometers, in order to constrain chirality, um, you need to have a more complicated uh, geometry than a, a simple planar uh, uh, interferometer. So uh, basically, in a, in a, um, a planar interferometer would not be able to tell if your stochastic gravitational wave background is circularly polarized. And this is because it's receiving uh, from all directions. So if there, is, there are no anisotropies in your background, then um, you will not be able to tell um, uh, if it's um, if there is a net chirality, um, so you have to effectively break this planarity, and you can do that, for example, by combining uh, different interferometers located in, in the, uh, different places on Earth, so which are non-coplanar. And then uh, the other thing you can do um, is to um, exploit the motion of the detector. So of a single, even a single detector. And the thing is, um, as I mentioned, um, if you have an isotropic stochastic radiation wave background, you can now distinguish um, a left secretly polarized uh, stochastic uh, uh, gravitational wave background from a right secretly polarized. But if it's moving, then it's effectively uh, detecting an anisotropic background. So you could use the, the motion in order to extract information about chirality. And this has been uh, uh, discussed in the literature in a number of works with some of, most of which I'm listing here. I'm hoping, I hope I'm listing, uh, let's say the, the most recent one as well as some more um, 
let's say earlier works and uh, yeah and you can do this uh, you can apply this technique both to ground base because of course the ground base are more, everything is moving along with the solar system or you can apply to the uh, space base and also to um, networks of space base or also to pulsar timing arrays so we have a number of, of ways that we, uh, with which we can constrain chirality. Um, again, I refer you to this paper for specific constraints on our model um, for a LISA-like or BBO-like uh, detector. And by like, we mean uh, multiplanar, so having multiple constellations because uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult with one constellation. And the reason being is that when you start using the motion of the detector, you have to go to the higher multiples, which are less sensitive than the monopole. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on to now. Okay, we've seen uh, chirality, we've seen an example of um, what we can, uh, can do in chirality. non gaussianity is also very important. Uh, I will spend the last part of this talk discussing on Gaussianity in both in, within these models and then more broadly, I will be asking the question of uh, uh, how can we constrain on Gaussianity with interferometers. And that will lead me to the last part of my talk, which is about anisotropies in the stochastic gravitational wave background from non Gaussianity and also in general. So this will be, let's say, the second, the second part of my talk. Um, and I'm not I'm not keeping time very well, so maybe if you can tell me like if five minutes before my talk is up would be great, so I don't go all the time because I don't remember what time it started. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, so, you still have time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right, uh, non Gaussianity. So when we talk about non Gaussianity, we are thinking about observables beyond the power spectrum. So, for example, we are talking about three point functions. And um, so the bispectrum. So when characterizing, when you characterize non Gaussianity, we normally refer to, uh, you know, we want to understand what is the amplitude and what is the shape. So by shape, I will be talking about refer, mentioning shape. And by that, what I mean is uh, for a given three point function, where is the signal more sharply uh, peaked, let's say, or where we have the highest chance of seeing something. And so the two shapes uh, that I would be referring to frequently in the stock are the squeezed. So when one of the modes is much, um, where one of the wave numbers is much smaller than the other two, one of the wavelengths is much larger than the other two, and the collateral, say, when the, the wavelength have pretty much the same uh, um, order magnitude. So non gaussianity is incredibly important um, uh, because we uh, this gives us a way of looking into the interactions of these fields during inflation. I'm talking about primordial non gaussianity, of course, just that. And so in our case, um, we can we can study non gaussianity if we study non gaussianity from the tensor from the uh, associated with the tensor so the, ten, the tensor by spectrum we're looking at either self interactions of the tensors or interactions of the tensors with other fields and I will give an example right now so if we want to uh, let's say put constraints on inflationary models this is really a very very important observable it's going to tell us what kind of fields are there what kind of interactions. Um, and if we go back to the axon gauge field models, um, this is an example of what the tensor non Gaussianity would look like. So uh, on, on this panel here on the right hand side, I'm showing uh, like a Feynman diagram that uh, can be um, predict, you know, can be drawn to uh, show the, the let's say the dominant contribution to now to the tensor non Gaussianity in these models. So you can have in particular in the models with the non abelian gauge fields. So you have here the tensor modes of the metric and they can be mediate their interaction can be mediated by gauge fields in a number of ways. And um, this is, uh, you know, can lead to like, observable non Gaussianity, for example, detectable by cosmic microwave background future missions. And this is to be uh, compared, this FNL is the amplitude, of course, of this signal. And this is to be compared with what would uh, occur in basic single field inflation where you have no such extra fields. So you only have the self interactions predicted by GR. 
And in this case, sorry, in this case, we have a much smaller signal. So this is an example of this, uh, what this observable can do for us. And then one can also look into mixed non gaussianity so interactions between the scalar degrees of freedom and the tensors, which can also be mediated in, in um, axiom gauge field models by these uh, gauge fields, of course. And um, all right, okay, and this is more uh, constraints on what the mixed tensor scalar scalar non gaussianity would uh, look like. And this, this, of course, keeps into account all the constraints that we have also from um, the scalar sector, because, of course, when you go and calculate the mix or the tensor non gaussianity, you're going to, um, yeah, you have to also take into account uh, additional contributions that this fields could lead to, uh, could bring to the to the power spectra at uh, next to leading order. So for example, the loop order. So we have accounted for all of those in order to, um, in order to calculate these uh, values. All right, now let me go to interferometers. Now, if we, we know how to measure the sign with the symbol, we have constrained it, uh, constrained it. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't detected it, but we know how to constrain it. Now, what goes on at very high frequencies, it's uh, completely different. If we want to measure tensor non gaussianity with, um, for example, an interferometer, it is not uh, as simple. And the reason being is, okay, in this slide, I'm just, um, I'm just showing then, okay, when we think about the wave number, we think about the frequencies of the observed gravitational waves. When we think about the, um, the direction of this uh, uh, wave number, we are thinking about the the direction from which these modes are uh, incoming. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the important thing that I wanted to stress is that if we um, if we want to measure Nogasan interferometer directly, this is not this has been shown not to be possible. And the reason for that is uh, a simply Shapiro time delay. Um, so as the um, so the tensor modes from inflation at some point uh, they are frozen on superhorizon scale. At some point the uh, their wavelength becomes smaller um, than the horizon, and they let's say re-enter and they evolve. And at some point we observe them. Now from that from their let's say journey from in time from the horizon re-entry to observations, um, this tensor perturbations or gravitational waves or uh, gravitons, let's say we they had traveled through uh, traveled through um, throughout the universe and they have encountered structure. And um, the effect of um, the this gravitational uh, let's say scalar perturbations or structure or um, yeah perturbations in the universe we can we can um, you know, it's going to be felt as a uh, time delay um, that is, is going to depend, um, it's going to be different depending on the direction we are looking at. So for example, I'm, I wrote here the evolution equation for the tensor perturbations, which are, this is post-inflationary evolution of, uh, of the tensor perturbations, which are encountering this uh, long wavelength perturbation. So I'm here assuming that the long wavelength is uh, much, much, the perturbations are much, much longer than the tensor perturbations, which is a good assumption in these cases, of course. And so these uh, curvature perturbations are going to introduce a delta T here. And this will be different depending on the direction, but because then the signal that we observe is going to be equal to the superposition of um, all these uh, uh, modes from all the directions, then um, this time, this Shapiro time delay ends up decorrelating, um, so canceling any initial non gaussianity that you may have in your data, in your in your in your signal. So whatever non gaussianity uh, inflation has imprinted in the data, if you go and measure a three point function um, with your interferometer, is not going to be there. And, and so you might say, okay, then we can measure non gaussianity. Uh, actually, we, we still can. Um, um, there is a mess. Okay, thank you. Five minutes. Oh, right. Um, so we still can um, measure non gaussianity under certain um, 
uh, assumptions, meaning, uh, for example, one thing we can measure is the ultra so-called uh, so ultra squeeze non gaussianity meaning that it's a signal uh, which is large in the configuration where one of the wavelength is much larger than the other two. And this can be measured uh, in the form, uh, well, can be measured in principle, depending on how large it is, of course, and how sensitive our instrument is in the form of an isotropist. It is uh, imprinted in the stochastic gravitational wave background. So when I talk about anisotropies here, what I'm referring to is this uh, delta GW quantity. So this omega GW is the energy density of gravitational waves. And it is um, going to uh, be, a, um, you know, it can be broken down into the contributions from the different directions. Now, generally, uh, in, in the simplest models, these delta GW uh, primordial, um, they are either really, really tiny or not there. Yeah, let's say they're really tiny, they're not interesting at all. Um, in, uh, in, 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 in some classes of models though, which I will briefly mention if, uh, if I get there, um, these delta GW are, uh, however, um, can be interesting and can be in principle observable. And, um, and basically um, what happens is that if you have a, a three, a, if you have a squeeze by spectrum, so a correlation between a very long wavelength mode and two very short wavelength modes, the long wavelength mode will induce a contribution in the, in, in the two, uh, in the power spectrum of the short wavelength mode, which tells us how large this long short correlation is, uh, which is just quantified by this FNL. So, um, for example, if you have a tensor 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 squeeze by spectrum predicted by your inflationary model, this will induce, um, in general, a, your um, a quadrupolar um, anisotropy in your um, energy density of your gravitational wave background. And this quadrupolar anisotropy will know about the strength of this interaction and about the amplitude of the long wavelength perturbation. And we, um, this, this idea dates back to the idea of fossils, which was put forward by Mark Anikowski and collaborators uh, a while ago, and on which we've been working uh, and, and finding applications since then. And uh, with Matteo Fazello and Giamassimo Tazinato, we proposed these as a possible observable that we can use uh, very high frequencies when we're trying to, uh, so interferometers or um, positive timing arrays in order to constrain squeeze non gaussianity from inflation. And the same thing can happen uh, for the tensor uh, scalar scalars, uh, sorry, scalar tensor tensor perturbation. So if you have a, a, a correlation between a long wavelength scalar perturbations and, and two short wavelength tensor perturbations, this will induce a, a non-isotropy, which is proportional to the long wavelength scalar perturbations and to the uh, strength of this, uh, this uh, by spectrum. And this is uh, just a slide to mention uh, some classes of models where these effects may be large. And I'm not going to spend too much time on I mean, it, but if you're curious, I'm happy to answer any questions. And just to just to, for clarity, this is entirely uh, separate from the class of models that I discussed earlier, where you do not have large squeeze non gaussianity, you only have equilateral in those cases. And um, let me now. Um, mention a few things. These anisotropies that we expect from squeeze non gaussianity they will likely not be the only anisotropies there because uh, we also expect anisotropies uh, analogous to what we see in the cosmic microwave background due to the fact that the gravitons are propagating through structure and therefore they will be subject to um, the, the stochastic gravitational wave background will be subject to an will, will uh, present an isotropies uh, from Sachs Wolf, integrated Sachs Wolf, Doppler, just like CMB. Um, although um, they're not as easily observable. Um, and I, I wrote here, um, okay, this, this was uh, discussed in a number of works, uh, as, for example, early works by Albert Malasina and then Carlo Contaldi, and then more recently, um, uh, the group of Nicola and collaborators, uh, uh, Nicola Bartolo and collaborators, they did a very nice uh, uh, analysis where they presented full Boltzmann treatment. 
um, where also Carlo uh, actually started the, the Boltzmann treatment. And then um, you, can, you can find more in this uh, more recent paper. And so these anisotropies are also there. And they, um, of course, because they're proportional to the curvature perturbations times some order one quantity that will be proportional to the real lack of the order of 10 to the minus 5. Because uh, this is a long wavelength carriage of perturbation, so same with scale, let's say. It could be um, on very large scales, that would be the, the order of magnitude. And so an isotope is from long vicinity would be of the order of FNL times 10 to the minus 5. And because um, we have a, this uh, property, I think my time is up. <laughs> One minute, yeah, we'll conclude. Thank you. Um, um, of course, uh, depending on how large our non the non sanity is, then they could be observable or not. And I refer you to uh, these works uh, with uh, my collaborators um, uh, uh, in 2020 and 2021, including um, our student Amik, um, who is at UNSW. We, uh, and we, we look into these anisotropies and we computed the uh, the angular power spectra for a number of models and for uh, and we computed the cross correlations we cosmic microwave background and isotropies because these anisotropies are proportional to the long wavelength scalar perturbations therefore they are correlated with uh, um, anisotropies uh, from the cosmic microwave background and we did a full study of what these cro cross correlations would look like and how well we would be able to constrain uh, let's say different models with uh, the different instruments. And I refer you to this paper for all the details. And so my time is up. So let me just put the final slide. And I think um, my main point is um, that, uh, yeah, not only the cosmic microwave background, but also interferometers and PTA are interesting for testing inflation because beyond the vanilla scenario, we can have signals that are interesting for these instruments. And we have a number of observable with which we can disentangle uh, the cosmic microwave background, sorry, the uh, stochastic radiation ground from inflation from other sources, including astrophysical, although I didn't say too much about how well we can disentangle and so on, but um, I just wanted to give you an overview. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna stop here and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Oh, I will ask a question. Yeah, go, yeah. uh, just about the anisotropies in the stochastic uh, background, like what can be measured or what is expected to be measured? Like uh, where yeah. are we at? So this plot, I think, uh, in, so, okay. Um, so this is a, let's say, there's a lot of work in progress in this topic. So what I'm gonna tell you is just a very small portion of it. <laughs> what is there now on, on, uh, on the archive? So for example, in this plot, um, we are showing for different types of angular dependence of device spectrum and for different amplitudes and for different stochastic, uh, um, for different amplitude of the monopole, uh, what can be measured. So we uh, show, for example, that an FNL as small scales of the, for a tensor tensor scale along the sanity of the order 10 to, nine, 10 to the three for a monopole. Um, this is the relative error on FNL. So we want it to be less than one. And something like VBO will be able to, um, and maybe SKA with under, under certain assumptions, you know, we, made some assumptions uh, on these. Something like this would be able to be, we uh, could possibly see. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, for example, okay, how well we can do depends also uh, whether you have a, like a, a form like this, which is um, like Legendre polynomial of zero order or second order. So if we have a quadruple, it's harder. Um, of course, the amplitude of FNL would be have to be large, um, and the it depends on how large your background is. But in general, it would be much harder with something like Lisa, or uh, which is are these uh, blue lines, or with um, ground base like Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer, and easier with um, other instruments. So this this plot like give you an idea, and then depending on so depending on what your model is predicting. 
uh, you may be in one situation or the other. For example, here it would be, um, yeah. The, the quadruple will make it diff more difficult than the monopole. And uh, as soon as you go down from 10 to the three to much smaller values, then it's much harder to measure. But this again, this is only uh, for the non-Gaussianity from the NSR waste from non-Gaussianity. So it's like very restricted to that uh, kind of... Uh... And there's, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, a lot of developments, I think, in these directions. So we'll hear more about anisotropies in the in the coming months or year. <laughs>